Hey, all you cool cats and kitties. This is B Rad from 33 Sticks here at the Old Big Cat Rescue. Thank you. Welcome to 33 Tangents, a weekly podcast featuring a rotating panel of co hosts that all work together in the same company but live in different areas of the world. The discussions cover a wide variety of topics from digital analytics to working remotely to current happenings in business and technology. Our regular day-to-day conversations often go off in various directions, and the goal of this podcast is to share our ideas and find new ways to engage with others. awesome yeah but um yeah we we finished up we 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 watched the last two episodes last night and i'm just like th- this is unreal again like at times it just felt like something that you know you could only make up you know brian, hey, Kevin, brian. this is a message from your past <laughs> get me out from underneath the septic tank <laughs> <laughs> oh that's the best one out of that mm-hmm. whole thing. I watched that part probably 10 times over. <laughs> I couldn't get enough well, of it. I, I actually went and looked up his music videos. Oh, yeah. And, they're real. And they're real. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a gem. And then the, the local morning show, they had a segment about it today. And they, they said, like, there's going to be spoilers. Uh, so they were talking about it. And someone called in and said, I actually, they, they visited that place uh, back in 2014. They were like, you know, she and her husband went on a road trip to find like all those you know, roadside oddities. So that's one of the places that they stopped at. Have, have you guys ever been to a private zoo? No. no. We went to one down in Arizona, north of Phoenix, on our way to Sedona a couple of years ago. Um, it's called Out of Africa. I honestly didn't even think know that this was a thing. Yeah, I didn't, I don't either. Um, and honestly, like it was actually really cool. Um, this out of Africa place down in, uh, down in Arizona. Um, it didn't seem like it was run by a bunch of hillbillies that, um, you know, wanted to make music videos and were doing meth. Um, it was actually a really cool place. My kids loved it. Um, we actually got to feed a, a giraffe by hand like we went around on these like in like an old school bus um that they drove kind of in their little safari area and you know we got to actually hold out grass for the giraffes to come up and feed them and we also got to have a uh a sloth encounter where we were able to go into the actual area where the sloth was and like pet it and kind of hold it and um, feed the sloth, which was way cool as well. So, um, it's, it's totally different than like a public or public run or publicly funded uh, zoo, because it's a little bit more like they don't have all of the same rules and regulations or whatever. And it's kind of a little bit more free for all in, in that respect, which gives you a different experience. I thought it was actually really cool. Yeah, again, I didn't know this was uh, such a thing. Although there's a guy um, a couple miles east of me that has uh, camels in his yard. And I'm wondering real, if he just has camels? Yeah. No, yeah, actual camels. Okay. There's, I, 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 there's huh? a place down by you that has like um, a herd of like Texas longhorn cows too. Well, yeah, I mean, they, they, they raise their, their, that's like a whole farm operation right there. Like that's actually an operation, but, and maybe this other thing is as well. I don't know. Maybe like they're using it for camel milk or something, which I don't know is if that's legal in the United States. Cause someone was telling me that if, I don't know if it was camels or another animal, they said that the milk was really healthy, but it's illegal um, to produce it in the United States. Anyway, I, I don't know if that's an operation of something happening or it's a small private zoo or this guy just likes camels, but I'll have to see if I can take a drive um, over there and snap some photos of it. Oh, you have to now. Yeah. I think I think it's on Google Maps, though. I'm going to keep keep going. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, did 
you know, last year at Summit when you had the suite, um, you know, unfortunately I wasn't there. You know, did you have someone bringing up uh, little tiger cubs for for clients to, 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 pet, to play with? <laughs> uh, I, you know, had had I have uh, watched the show and gotten all the, uh, no, no, we did, we didn't sneak no, tiger cubs up there. No, I, mean, I was just trying to make, like, <laughs> yeah, cause, no, yeah, because the one dude was trying, you know, running stuff out of Vegas, and he'd have like he'd sneak cubs up into the room. Oh no, and, yeah. Yeah, he he had uh, like the shuttle going with uh, with the animals in the shuttle. That guy was a fraud, though. Well, oh, I guess yeah. they, maybe they all were, but he was a faker, right? He was the dude with the flat brimmed hat and like had the fake house that wasn't really his and the, the bandana the, under the, the hat. The car. Yeah, like he yeah, that none guy. of that none of that was really his, right? He was like all over leveraged on everything. Oh yeah, totally over leveraged. Yeah, our beards are looking good, by the way. Oh yeah, I'm going on like three weeks with just just a basic trim, like once, and that's it. We're but, uh, we're just we're just kind of going with the flow, but Bryant looks like he's actually gotten like a professional lineup and like the hair trimmed and everything. I don't quite know if I understand what's happening here. Yeah. Well, at this point, the hair is starting to get messy, so I'm going to see how long I can go grow, and then depending upon how things go, I'm actually just going to buzz it. Just really? go back and buzz it off. Yeah. Have you done the buzz off thing? Because no, you just sent you sent me a uh, what did you send me a picture of? Like a work ID, ID college ID. College ID. You, you, you had a you had like a semi afro thing going on there. Yeah, awesome. but was... like I had the hair going down the <laughs> here and everything. But um, no, like I'm at the point right now. It is so thin up here. Like when it grows in, it looks awful. So I've actually been tempted for for a few months now just to buzz it off and see how it looks. You should. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it'll grow back, you know, that well, which is we can left. hope. We can hope. <laughs> That's always my fear. Like, I grow it on, I'm like, is this the time maybe it's not going to grow back? No, no. It, what I have left will grow back. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm Google mapping this place while we're talking here. And I like the, uh, the kids in the background. It makes it real. It's, I'm not the only one that has the kids being crazy in the background. Are your kids are your kids uh, having fun, Brian? Yeah, they're out there uh, doing some schoolwork right now. Uh huh. Having uh, having a good time there. Oh, here it is. It's called. I think this is it. It looks like it is maybe a business. Uh, I, I'm kind of embarrassed to even say what it is now. I'm not going to say. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I guess I should have looked this up a long time ago instead of just like driving by it, wondering like, why does this guy have? Why does he have camels in his front why yard? Why does this have camels in his yard? Oh, and there's a website for it and everything. So you're not you're not gonna tell us what you're looking at. You're just gonna be weird about it. Well, I'm kind of embarrassed. the The name of the business is called Alpine Living Nativity. Oh, so they have like they supply camels for living nativity scenes, then I guess. Mm -hmm. Nice. No, and oh, well, and it looks like it's a destination. Here's. Uh, it looks like there's some stuff in the off season here. Here, I'll I'll, I'll message you guys the website here. And see, I don't know if that's their camels in the picture or or not. I wonder if there's like a whole camel thing, you know, with like crazy camel people, like there's crazy tiger people and like they fight amongst each other. And maybe that's the next Netflix show. These guys raised $70,000 for organizations in 2018. After many years, we're located, we found ourselves in need of a new, we have a new piece of land, blah, 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 16 years, Merry Christmas. I don't know. Yeah, so it looks like they're doing some kind of nativity thing. Interesting. Yeah, so there you go. There's the story behind those camels. But yeah, I, I, I see Tiger King becoming like a series now. Well, there's, well they're they're, they're going to have their spinoffs, right? They're going to have yeah. their own spinoffs like on Discovery Channel. Yeah, well, they're, they're going, I, I bet you they'll, they're, they're going to, people are going to force them to do follow-ups on a lot of those characters because they were, you know, when there was like the postscript, you could tell like things happened after they were done filming. Um, mm -hmm. so, and, um, one of the sheriff's deputies down in Florida has now all of a sudden gotten a, a slew of leads. Brian sent me the article earlier. 
uh, mm-hmm. regarding the, the cold case with Carol Baskin's ex-husband. Um, and then, yeah, they're going to have spinoffs like, you know, around other kind of exotic animals people keep as pets. I bet you it's going to become a series on Netflix. There, there's a there's a 95% chance that Bryant is actively involved in a uh, thread. Um, isn't there a slash R slash something with Carol Baskin's husband and they're looking for leads and there's private sleuths and detectives. Mm, I have no idea. Yeah, come on. For real. No, I go into Reddit conspiracy, Reddit, <laughs> get motivated Reddit. Um, Private fish trading. Next effing level. Um, there's a few of those, but no, I've I've actually never heard of that. I'm Reddit. I'm honestly shocked to hear that. Hey, five percent, you know. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's that that five percent chance. Yeah, Brian's Brian's into some of these weird Reddit threads, mm-hmm. and then he makes me go watch these movies. And he was the one that first started talking about the Tiger King, and I'm like, I can't do it because I think the last one he made me watch was some Bob Lazar or something, something Area Fifty One or so. I can't remember which one it was, <laughs> but you know which one I'm talking about. That was like within the first ten minutes. I'm like, I can't do this. <laughs> That wasn't Area 51. I'm okay. not gonna I'm not gonna acknowledge But you know which one I'm talking was. about, right? Yeah. yeah. By the way, Jim has watched that in its entirety. So oh, I quit ten minutes in and I, yeah, I didn't Jim go and back. I, Jim and I are best friends and I don't know what you are to me. I, I'm a little bit more sane than the rest of you then, because that, that was that was a little too much for me. Even me, that was a little bit too much. Really? Yeah. I, I couldn't do it. I, I just I couldn't do it. So, no, I found that one interesting. All right. Well, what are we actually here to talk about today? So what we're here to talk about today. So this is an idea that came up um, from conversations Bryant and I had in person in Boston at this point, like a little over a month ago. Um, And it's going to be around office bullies. So every office has one. And, you know, I know the three of us have all dealt with them. Um, You know, this person demands that their items out are always addressed first. Um, they demean, they demand, they force, they yell, they demean, they, they throw temper tantrums. You know, they're the first to go to your boss or your b- boss's boss or hire to get what they want. So a couple things I want to cover in this conversation are how do you deal with an office bully? Um, dig a little deeper into why they are who they are. You know, are they using this approach to overcompensate or hide for something? And then what's the worst story you have uh, regarding an office bully? I haven't worked in an office in like 15 years, so. It could be a virtual office. I know. I was just thinking of a Seinfeld clip. Sorry, I'm having a hard time focusing today. Um, think about, um, I mean, I I think, I think we ought to really kind of, so you 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 put a definition out there as well, I think we can also talk about like ways that it manifests itself or typical personality types and um, typical roles, like a lot of salespeople perhaps um, turn into that. They want everything done last minute because they're in an urgent mode. And instead of like being reasonable with you as an individual that has other priorities, they turn into a, a total jerk and, um, they're like the first to CC everybody in the organization, including their boss and your boss and, you know, putting all sorts of weird pressure on you to get things done. Like that's, that's probably the most common form of, of office bullying I've run into. Um, you know. How much of it is um, Lord of the flies versus what um, Jim seated that it's a defense mechanism. Not not necessarily defending your position, but defending against maybe feeling uncomfortable or un uh, what's the right word um, unprepared to to hold the inadequate. job inadequate inadequate yeah um, well I think the Lord of the Flies scenario is is real um, but it's a broader like cultural issue at that point as opposed to it being an individual. And I have seen that. I've I've seen individuals that in in any other circumstance are amazing, awesome, sympathetic people, but once they get put into a particular role, 
um, immediately kind of adhere to what is going on in the culture. Do you think that that's because we've been trained to think about work as to your point, a role, um, maybe much like an, an athlete that you get them on the court and they turn into a killer, but off the court, people are like, Oh, it's the nicest guy in the world. But you know, that's just a different persona he has. It, do you think that that's in part because we've um, kind of abstracted ourselves away from who we are personally to play a specific role to survive in the business world that maybe isn't really our true character? I don't know if it's that, but maybe, maybe it's one of those things where it, it brings out, you know, something that might be innate within you that normally wouldn't say surface outside of work. You know, maybe it brings out that hyper competitive attitude or it, it brings out that, that, that person that has no problem steamrolling somebody, um, you know, in an office setting. I can, I can see that. Um, from from personal perspective, um, I, I always struggled with being a good corporate game player. Uh, and I think part of it was my personality. Part of it is just like, I, I just didn't want to be part of that. But I would say three years into my first job out of college, I, I concluded that it would be worth it just from an experimental experiential standpoint to, to see if I could, quote, play the game. Um, and see if I could measure the impact of it. Would I get a raise? Would I get a promotion? Would I get more bonuses? And and I really kind of set out and detailed how I would change who I was in the workplace to play that game and become more of that kind of toxic bully personality that I saw that was kind of getting um, their, their leg up on the ladder. And I lasted maybe two months. I couldn't do it. I, I just couldn't do it. And then I, just, I think it just wasn't my personality. So as much as I kind of accepted that it was just going to be a role that I would play, um, I couldn't even fake it. I just, what just bugged you it. about it? Just didn't feel authentic. Just didn't, I felt, I felt dirty. I felt, I didn't feel good about myself. I felt worse, you know, as, as frustrated as I was working in the corporate environment, playing this role for just a couple months made me feel much, much worse. So I think I think there is some kind of a, a personality component to that. We should have Evan on to talk about personality of office bullies. I'm sure he has some thoughts on <laughs> psychology he would he could share. Um, yeah, but I you know I I don't know that I have any specific stories of um, hardcore bullies that I've had to to deal with. With that said, on the consulting side, I've definitely had my share of challenging personalities that I think could come across as a bully. Um, but the majority of those was very evident to me that they were overcompensating, uh, that they felt uh, very insecure in their position. And rather than being open and collaborative, they put up walls and tried to play the tough guy because they were, they were very insecure. And it's unfortunate, you know, because especially from a, uh, a consulting perspective, and I don't know, maybe people have been burned by consulting before, but we've always gone in with the, with the notion that we're there to make the people that we partner with rock stars um, and, and kind of give them the, the glory, but maybe that isn't how it, it always is. And so maybe people are concerned that a consultant's going to come in and and expose people for not being as amazing as they've talked themselves up to be. I, I don't know. I don't know what goes through people's heads. Well, so, I mean, this, this came about, Jim, we were having dinner um, in Boston after visiting one of our clients and you were talking about, you were talking about kind of a situation you had been in um, and, you know, just the sense of urgency and the constant stress and panic. Not related to that client, by the way. This is nope. <laughs> several years ago. Yeah. Let's yeah. throw that caveat in. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and just kind of how it totally disrupted your, your ability to get things done, but also like, you know, at a, per, on a personal level, just like how it impacted your personality, right. And your, um, you know, your own psychology. Do you want to share some of that? Yeah. I've told parts of that story before. So this is going back 
eight, nine years ago, working on the agency side of <clears throat> this one company. And I just moved over from the product side. They had moved the entire analytics team over from, from, from product to, to, to agency. And, um, first meeting with this one guy we're working on a mutual client i've been working with this client for months now and he comes in and he just proceeds to drop the f-bomb left and right why the f doesn't it do this and why the f doesn't it do that and why the f can't i get this data and the first thing i thought of like i was kind of like shell-shocked i'm like who are you you know who are you what how are you related to this client and um you know it I just told him I said it wasn't designed to do that. And, you know, he proceeds to yell and scream. And that became, you know, that's how I realized he managed everything, you know, over the next couple of years. I just realized that that's how he did everything. He did his yelling and, and then screaming to the point where I went to my boss and said, I will never work with him again. And, you know, she was like, no, you, you can't do that. I'm like, I will quit if I have to work with him again. Because I, I can't take just the constant berating, um, just the yelling and the screaming and the emergencies, because that one client I was working with was one of several. And, um, you know, trying to, to plan out stuff, working with various project teams when stuff was scheduled, he had no problem coming in and disrupting whatever was planned, demanding that, you know, his stuff be taken first, regardless of what else was going on. Um, and I'm just like, I, I can't, no, I'm, I'm, I, I just, I, I can't be successful working with him. You know, we can't be successful, right. um, because he ultimately, um, you know, just bullies his way through stuff, you know, to, to, to take from the title of the episode. And now looking back several years later, I really think that he, you know, I'll say it like I, 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 there's a couple things. One, I think what he was in charge of, there was no tangible way to show that it actually had an effect. Like, you know, th there was no way to prove that what he was demanding be done actually was, was effective. So I think it's the, and I can't remember the term at the moment. It's, um, you know, that the, the, the louder I scream, the more people, more serious people will take me. So people won't question the effectiveness of what I'm trying to get done because I scream so loud. That, and I think um, if you also had a bit of the Peter principle happening where he was definitely promoted to, you know, beyond his, his capacity. So he didn't have a full grasp of what was going on. So again, people will take me seriously if I yell and scream. That seems um, like it can't be a long-term strategy but maybe it is like how how long was this person in his role and had he moved up through the ranks oh he he was there until i left um he he, he somewhere somehow you know endeared himself to to those above him um and i'll be honest though like overall it was not a great atmosphere overall because i think there were a lot of other people around him just like him so that's why it was allowed to, to, to happen. But no, it, you're right. In most normal cases, that wouldn't have lasted a long time. It wouldn't have been successful. But somehow he was, he was able to get into place and, and stay there. Do you think um, we're in a cultural shift away from the bully being the one at, at the top of the organization, the one that's seen as a superstar? No. 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 I, the reason I say that is because, um, and then I'm interested in why you both say no. Um, we, we we've we've beaten up um, Silicon Valley a lot, and we've kind of poked at a lot of the toxic uh, culture that that they create. But one thing that I've seen almost consistently uh, across a lot of brands in Silicon Valley is they've come up, and this is specifically for for software engineers. They've come up with and said, we don't care how amazing you are. Um, if you're a jerk, you're not going to be here. Um, but, you know, maybe maybe that's just an outlier. I think that's also some lip service. Um, you think? As opposed to it's actually virtue following technology. through. Because, you know, the, the reality is if a company has somebody that's a rock star, 
at what they're doing, they usually do let them get away with whatever the hell they want to do um, because of that. And, and you look at, you know, I, I don't want to make it, or I don't want to take this whole discussion like a completely different way. Um, but I will throw out the example, you know, you look at the political system and, um, you know, whether you're, you're a, a supporter of our current president or not, the way that he communicates about all of the coronavirus and everything about just listening to him talk about the other governors and how they're whining and now he's not going to help them and do this. Like he in and of himself is exhibiting bullies, bullying tactics um, to further what he wants to do or not want to do. And I think that's just symptomatic of, of American culture as a whole. I, I've brought this up a couple of times in the podcast and just that the narcissistic, um, egocentric, almost sociopathic type personalities are the ones that rise to the top because um, they're willing to step on anybody and um, sacrifice anybody and anything for their own gain and their own progression. Um, and I've, you know, unfortunately I've seen it over and over again in companies I've worked for as well as companies I've worked with as a consultant. It's kind of a depressing view of the world. Sorry. But- no, but but maybe that's the reality, right? And I mean, I think we've we've all definitely had our our share of experiences with it, and um, that that hyper aggressive, tell it like it is person does tend to kind of rise to the top and get more airplay. And maybe you're right. Maybe it's it's actually becoming worse that it's becoming more and more accepted that. Um, the bully is the type of person that that we want to lead organizations. I, I mean, I would hope not. I, I just, I don't, I don't think I don't it's think healthy. It's the, I don't think if anybody thinks about it, I don't think it's what they want per se, but ultimately it's, it's those personalities that rise up and put themselves in the position to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, I think back to, um, you know, Jason, you and I never crossed paths when we were at Omniture, but, you know, there was there was different personalities there that definitely were bullyistic uh, or bully. Bullyistic? Is that a word? Did I just make something up? It's a new word now. Characteristics of a bully, bullyistic um, in in how they uh, how they operated, um, you know, and if you look at, at where, you know, some of those individuals are right there at the top of certain companies now. Right. And so that's in the space of 10, 15 years and how that's exhibited. So, well, you and I talk a lot about the culture around here and in the Silicon Slopes uh, area as well. Um, In fact, I remember I remember this time you and I were at a at a sushi shop and, you know, I overheard some of the, the conversations around us and it was just it was laughable. It wasn't necessarily bully, but just that just the absolute lack of authenticity um Mm -hmm. obvious uh, way that that manifests itself with people when they're trying to win business or impress people (laughs) um is is just it's it's funny yeah well i mean let's talk you know how we've seen this manifest in sports a bit we're all sports fans here um and you know we've all heard the cliche winning cures all ills I mean, how many times do you hear, you know, about like a team that's won a championship or two and, you know, they're they're playing great on the the field or the court, but then as that championship window starts to close and they start to disassemble the team, you start to hear about feuds or Mm -hmm. the one person that, um, you know, demanded the spotlight, you know, like when teams are winning or when companies are winning, they'll tolerate a lot to continue to win. And we've seen it time and time again that sports teams will tolerate, you know, that asshole in the locker room if it means a chance at at winning a championship. And I think, Jason, going back to your question and my perspective of it, the reason why I don't think it's going away anytime soon is because of that. If you, you know, many companies, I think, will virtue signal and say that we're not going to tolerate this attitude but if you've got a rock star sales rep that closes deal after deal after deal, but is a complete jerk to everybody in the office, they're going to look the other way. 
um, I don't see many companies that are, are going to, to not tolerate that. And I'm not necessarily picking on sales, but you could find it, you know, elsewhere, whether it's maybe somebody in operations, you know, a client success manager or a project manager. Um, if they successfully complete a project on time to make a client happy or, you know, the, the, the client success manager that is able to keep a client happy and keep renewals coming in, they're not going to rock the boat um, because, you know, people, you know, also see them as a bully. Mm -hmm. But, but the Marcus cousins stuck around Sacramento for a long time and they were, per, they were a pretty crappy basketball team. Well, and look at where he is now too, right? He's, you know, well, so, so that's another perfect example. To, to be I, fair. I like, I like Boogie. Uh, <laughs> I just, he's pretty toxic though. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, I can't think of the coach's name right now for whatever reason. Who's the head coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Jim, come anyway, I can't think of his name. But when LeBron was playing on his team, like he was having massive like health issues, like and um, you know having heart issues, and once once LeBron finally got traded off of the Cavaliers team. Um, the owner publicly stated he's glad to have his organization back, right? So, hmm. you know, while LeBron is like one of the greatest NBA players of all time and is going to win, you are are making a decision to bring in someone that has a pretty uh, bad reputation um, for being a teammate and a player on in in an organization if he doesn't get his way. Yeah. And, and bringing it more locally, right? We remember when, uh, you know, Darren Williams was going through his thing here at the Utah Jazz and ultimately caused a Hall of Fame coach and Jerry Sloan to quit midseason and say, I'm done, I'm not putting up with this anymore. Ultimately, Darren gets traded away, um, you know, and he's since come back and said he was such an idiot for what he did. But again, like when you've got a, a star player on a, on a professional football or professional basketball team, or a star employee that ultimately gets cash in the door or profits improving that they can then report out to wall street to help earnings. Yeah. Uh, you know, companies are willing to sacrifice culture for cash. So that kind of supports Jim's sales guy thing that that that's oftentimes a win at all costs. Yep culture right like we'll we'll bring in the guy that's you know a, a complete dumpster fire he's gonna run re wreak havoc in the organization people are gonna quit and be unhappy but he's gonna double our sales so it's okay yep or yep. or once they have that person and they realize that they're toxic um i think the other flip side to all of this is in big companies in corporate america it's extremely difficult to fire somebody. Um, it's extremely difficult to move them on. And so oftentimes organizations will make that person uncomfortable at most so that they'll find another job within the company, but they don't ever resolve the issue. Um, in my role that I had at, at Adobe, there was, there was instances that I was working with individuals to try and help them improve either behavioral problems or performance-based problems. Um, and while working with them, you know, ended up actually getting a job in another part of the organization. And, you know, that was, that was lost. Right. So even when there is somebody that's willing to take the time and to work with individuals, I've seen it firsthand in which um, those individuals can fly under the radar or just move around. And our culture is so open. And in fact, it rewards you switching jobs every 18 months to 24 months that really no change can happen in that much amount of time. Yeah. We should talk about that as a future episode. Cause I think there's a lot to dig into on why there's so much, um, why, why the job market is so transient and people move. Um, so, so quickly. Cause everything, I think everything is, is to address the immediate need of right now, but not for the company or customer needs, but it's my needs as an individual. And I'm not talking about me personally, I'm talking about the, uh, the broader term of, of how people look at it and whatever that individual needs to do to move from job A to job B and get the next promotion or the next title increase, they'll do. Yeah. Um, and then 
were rewarded. Like you get a bigger pay increase by leaving your job and going elsewhere than sticking around, which is also toxic, but another topic. So, yeah, no, I mean, and, and it's an interesting conversation around, um, the halo effect around keeping people in, in the organization. Um, and is it something that, so you were in a, in a, in a leadership position at Adobe. Is, is that a topic that ever, ever came up? And I'm, I'm, you know, where I'm watching the, um, the Seinfeld, um, series. Um, and I'm deep into that right now. Remember when Elaine brought Eddie Sherman up from the mail room and then promoted him to copywriter because he didn't, he didn't fit the culture of the group. And everyone was like, okay, I, I promoted him. I promoted him. Him. He's, we don't have to deal with him anymore. I've solved that. I promoted him and everyone's <laughs> pissed off about it. Um, no, but, but in, in all seriousness, you know, in your capacity as a, as a leader, I I'm sure dealing with difficult personalities and, and bullies probably came up. Is, is that something that, that you and your leadership team ever discussed as far as the collateral damage that they were doing balanced out with maybe the value that they were bringing as, as perhaps maybe a strong player? It didn't come up. So you said you started that whole thing by saying, I'm sure it, it came up and was discussed and it was not. Um, I had, I wished it was, and I, I worked tirelessly to change certain parts of the culture, um, in my role where I could. Um, but yeah, that, that topic never came up. Is there a reason why it, it never came up that you, that you can think of? Um, I think there was, uh, there was so much other focus on reacting to other specific needs and revenue needs that, um, you know, the topic around like, uh, those higher level type thinking and, and culture aspects weren't, weren't addressed. It was very operational and very much, how do we get through this week and hit our numbers to next week and so forth. So it seems like we're, we're saying that, that money seems to be the, the common driver here that, um, if, you know, if we can win championships and make more money, if we can close more sales deals this quarter and make more money, if we have strong consultants um, that upsell really well and we can make more money, that that, that that basically cancels everything else out and that it's it's okay to deal with toxic personalities. It's okay to have bullies in our organization, even at the risk of making the bulk of our staff maybe uh, unhappy with their jobs. We're okay to put up with it because they, they produce. Well, so, so Jason, what was what was your undergraduate degree in? Information systems. Jim, what what did you what's your degree in? What did you study? Uh, management? Yeah, um, and I I did you know marketing management and you know went through business school and and how often did you hear and even you Jason in your your classes that you had to take the quote cash is king all the time like that's that's like the basis of all things business cash is king. So you see that to people that are up and coming into business, cash is king, cash is king, cash is king. And then you look at the most successful companies and they're the ones that have the most cash, right? Like there's, there's more that is ingrained in our brain to think cash is king and we should do anything we can to get more cash at the company um, that that's, that's where it stems from. So I, I totally believe that, you know, what we've kind of come across here and, and discussed is, yeah, ultimately bullies are okay if they're bringing in cash because cash is king. So is it? I mean, maybe, I so. maybe, it's, maybe it's, maybe it's, maybe it's not wrong. Maybe, maybe we should flip the script and say we should be looking for bullies because they tend to out um, produce everyone else. And that's the ultimate measure we should be looking at. Well, we're, we're talking as a group of individuals for a small agency with a very different out, you know, view on, on corporate America and why we do what we do. But you look at, you know, if I were to put myself in a position as a major, even a minor shareholder in any company, I could care less what the culture is at that company if I'm earning money on my investment, right? So 
um, you know, if you do flip it around and not talk about us as individuals working for a company or have worked at jobs and companies, and you think about it as those that don't have to deal with it, but is looking at it from an investment and cash is king. So this yeah. is getting, and so this is getting off topic, but you bring up an interesting point. Um, and, and I think we may have touched on it in, in previous episodes, but then as individuals, do we have any responsibility then to um, put our money where our mouth is and support the things that we believe are, are healthy? Um, we, we've talked about this a lot in kind of cancel culture where, you know, people are like, I'm not going to shop at fill in the blank Hobby Lobby. I'm not going to go to, you know, fill in the blank Chick-fil-A. You know, or My I don't support Amazon.com. He won't. He refuses to support Amazon for whatever reason, right? So, but but my question is: is should we be doing that? Like, you know, if we say, look, in our professional career, we want to support environments that are healthy for us, but in our personal life, we're going to consume and support environments that are the direct opposite of what we believe in do we have some kind of personal responsibility to um think broader than ourselves and here we are at the meta topic <laughs> i don't know but i mean I, you kind of like flipped the switch in my head when you said that mm -hmm. i'm like it's it's an interesting conversation um and I, I don't know the answer because I've always been on the other side of it of, man, if you're going to do that, you're going to spend your whole day researching every single company in their like endless supply chain to find a reason why you should or shouldn't support them. And it seems unfeasible. But is there some level of our consumerism that maybe should be a bit more informed to better align with what we see as our ideals of a, of a healthy work environment? Yeah, I think we should ask uh, Jen Coons. She grew up in in the Pacific Northwest, and I think, and I bring that up specifically not not that she you know fits the whole paradigm, but I think she could speak to um, just that region of the country that I think is taking a very deliberate uh, you know approach of of looking at impact on environment and impact on culture and, and personality. It seems like the culture in that part of the country is, is trying to be a little bit different in that respect. I think the flip side is though, it can easily be manipulated too. Right. And, you know, the cynic in me is like, well, I could, I could start a company that says I'm doing all of these things organically, quote unquote. Um, and, uh, you know, say I do all of these great things, but in the end, it's still about cash, right? It's still about making the buck. Doesn't that bring us full circle back to Carol Baskin? It totally does. <laughs> but does it not? Mm -hmm. And how she doesn't pay her employees? Well, you know, she she portrays this image of what, you know, this this wholesomeness and, and doing something for a specific yeah. reason. But the whole operation behind it is the exact opposite of that. Mm hmm. So yeah, she's I've... gaming it. She's gaming it, as you as you said. So, yeah, you might be a cynic, but coming back to how we started the conversation, we have a real world example where that is absolutely what is happening. Is yeah, that, I mean, I think it's world. It's, it, it, <laughs> what you're telling me that that's produced on a stage. That's, <laughs> that's the real deal, man. Um, you know, I, I think, you, you know, you bring up a good point. Like, I mean, if, yes, if you're going to try to research every company that, you know, do they kind of align with your morals? One, I think, it's going to be hard and, and yes, it's easy for you to be gamed um, because how many times do we see food that says it's organic, but then it's not really organic. Um, and that, that's just one example that comes to my head. Um, yes. I think you could definitely vote with, with your wallet. I would say be selective, like at least God, like this is just gonna be stream of consciousness kind of responding to this whole thing. I, I think you need to be selective um with how you apply that or yeah you're going to be wasting your time and you're laughing what, what are you laughing at brian sending me direct messages <laughs> oh okay so so okay um <laughs> sorry but i think to, to, to your point it, it's it, it's creating that that environment right i go back to what you've told me at the very beginning you know when you worked at companies and you saw examples of of bad management of these kind of people you started writing a list of 
if you ever ran your own company, how you would do things. And that's so much easier said than done. And how long did it take you to get here? You know, th th that's the question that didn't happen overnight. But I think if this is something that you don't find healthy, put your focus in, in creating an environment where that doesn't happen. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I think as, as individuals, we need to, to do that, but it's to what next. Well, oh, he's, you're seeing the direct yeah, I'm seeing what he sent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's easier said than done. You know, I mean, it took me what, 15 years to get to a place where I'm like, okay, I can make some, some decisions. Um, but I think, Let me yeah, it's out there too, right? Like, um, all of us are, you know, on this conversation right now, our husbands and fathers, right? We have, we have more limits, so to speak, on the freedom to do whatever we want for, for the sake of doing what we want versus needing to take care of those that we're obligated to take care of and we've committed to taking care of too, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, can't, I can't just go out there and say, I'm never going to shop at amazon.com um, even though they have like really competitive pricing and the way they get products to me because sometimes it's, it's the convenience of what I need for my family. Right. Or I can't, um, you know, Walmart gets picked on all the time. You know, like I can't say, Oh, I will never shop at Walmart. But in the end, when you buy packaged goods and packaged foods, like price perspective, taking care of my family, it makes sense to shop at Walmart. Right. So, um, versus if you're a, you know, somebody else that doesn't have these same types of, of commitments and obligations, maybe you have more freedom to be able to, to live your life in a way that you could make all of those decisions or that's a sacrifice I'd have to make and, and convince others to do with me. Yeah. Well, uh, so how do we wrap this up other than saying, um, what's the stupid saying? Nice guys finish last. We don't have to be jerks, right? Um, and I don't think we should have to put up with bullies and we don't need to necessarily go to the point of changing our entire lifestyle and, and, you know, going down that meta conversation of what companies do we, and don't we support? I think each of us should look at our, our current environments and say, is this healthy for us? Right. Cause, um, I, I think it's the Dow. There's a chapter in the Dow that talks about if you want to change the world, the best place to start is with yourself. Yeah. You know, we, we try to go way outside of ourselves and change something, this machine that is just very difficult to, to, to move. Um, the easiest place is to start with ourselves. And um, then that goes out to our families, to your point, Brian, you know, um, the decisions we make aren't just impacting ourselves, but that seems like the, the best place to start. And um, for me, I wish I would have learned that lesson very early in my career, but I didn't. Again, I was very frustrated trying to change everybody else. And what I should have been thinking about is, well, how do I want to be, you know, I can, I can influence myself and I just need to be content um, that I'm doing things and I'm making decisions and choices that align with my, my ideals and, and leave it at that. Well, and, and for us, I think in, in our industry um, and we've taken a very deliberate approach and that's why again, like I, I wanted to, to join the team here was just the deliberate approach of, of, of making that impact and that, that connection with our clients where we could have that direct influence to maybe change some of that about them. And um, I look back at my, my career at Adobe and, you know, the, the ability to change the organization and change these broad sweeping um, you know, huge uh, groups of, of people and operations was not, not feasible, but where, where did I have an impact was on the direct members of my team that I was able to manage and, and communicate one-on-one -on -one with, um, and really help coach them into, to doing things differently for themselves. Or, you know, I, I, I remember having countless conversations with people about, um, time off and how it was so difficult for some people to, to wrap their mind around being billable and having a billable target for a quarter and then, you know, having to quote unquote, make that up if they took time off. And the reality was it's a shift in mindset. And I, I worked with a lot of people and helped them get to the point where I convinced them, look, you could take a week off every, every quarter and nobody's going to have issues with that. 
um, you've got to think about it differently, right? And so there are those things that we can do either in a leadership role or as peers and, and working with others. Where, where can we make that influence? We're not going to change the president in the United States. We're not going to change the CEO of Amazon or Microsoft or whoever that might be. But in the end, you know, who do we have direct influence over and, and how can we work with them? Yeah, uh, agreed. I like it. Um, I'm going to go uh, surf some subreddits and see if there are any uh, theories about season two of Tiger King. Um, and, There's got to uh, be a season two coming. And I'm just grateful that I don't work with any bullies or jerks. So thanks, guys. Yep, same here. Cool. Thanks so, for letting me on, guys. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for the yeah, time. And Come back anytime, Brian. Oh, oh cool. Yeah. Be rad. Be rad. Be rad. <laughs> You're welcome back anytime. Yeah, it was a good time. Good time. Yep. Cool. All right, guys. We'll catch you later. Bye. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of 33 Tangents. If you enjoyed what you heard, please rate and review the show on your favorite podcast aggregator so others can find us. If you would like to reach us, you can do so by emailing podcast at 33sticks.com or on the web at 33tangents.33sticks.com. 33 Tangents is a production of 33 Sticks, an analytics boutique.